Hello everybody, welcome back to Off Meta Musings. I'm your host, Itan, and today we're going to be looking at the Jade Obelisk. We're going to be going through the fighters, we're going to be looking at their abilities, doing list building, and trying to do a deep dive into see how they play and what they're up to in your games of Warcry. So if you've just picked up Sundered Fate, or if you wanted to see just how Jade Obelisk are doing in general, this is going to be the video for you. To start with, their reaction, Curse of Jade. It reads, a fighter can make this reaction when they are targeted by a melee attack action but before hit rolls are made. You subtract one from the damage points allocated to this fighter by each hit and critical hit from their attack action to a minimum of one. This is essentially the good version of the other damage reduction reactions. So if we look at Nurgle, for example, Nurgle Rotbringers, their reaction only reads that they reduce the damage from normal hits. It doesn't read critical hits also. But this, of course, Curse of Jade does do both hits and critical hits alike. I do think that this reaction is here to complement the relatively high damage of your basic fighters. You'll see that they're extremely points efficient and they do a lot of damage individually, but they don't have all that many wounds. So effectively, the idea is if you're ever attacked, if they're going to hit you with enough damage that's going to be able to one hit kill you, you can always use this reaction, reduce the damage and then swing back still for a lot of damage so you don't really lose all that much by using this reaction in in order to save your life it's worth noting that the average damage profile in the game you're looking at two four so reducing any two four attack to what's effectively a one three attack makes for a very worthwhile action investment Moving forward, we're going to go into the Nephrite Priestess, but there's a couple of things that I wanted to mention before. We've got the points per wound stat that you're going to see here. Now, the points per wound stat is a damage per attack calculated on a weighted damage average, assuming that 25% of the fighters you're going to be fighting are sitting at toughness 3, 50% are sitting at toughness 4, and the rest are sitting at toughness 5. So to give you some idea as to where the different fighters sit on this scale, you've got something like Graveguard, which which are widely considered to be the most efficient unit in the game, are sitting at a value of 12.7. Escape and Storm Fiends are sitting on around 20, and the Death Master is sitting at about, around about 25. Less than 25 puts whichever fighter we're looking at in the top 30% of all fighters in the game, and so that means that they're generally considered to be very efficient in terms of damage output versus the points you're investing. But let's go, let's carry on. Onto our Nephrite Priestess. She costs 105 points. She has four attacks, strength three with one four damage, which is it's a bit on the low side, but it's it's, it's kind of average for a low pointed kind of support character. She has movement four. She has toughness three and 20 wounds, which is generally pretty good for the 105 points you're spending. She has the hero and the priest room up. Uh, she comes with two abilities, Stone Warp and Bloody Tribute. So Stone Warp is common between all of the Jade Obelisk fighters. And that reads, the fighter can use this ability if they're within nine inches of a visible friendly fighter with the Jade Obelisk and Icon Bearer rune marks. You remove a number of damage points allocated to the fighter equal to half the value of this ability rounding up. And if the fighter is also within six inches of a friendly fighter with a Jade Obelisk and Priest rune marks, you remove a number of damage points allocated to this fighter equal to the value of the ability instead. So, if you are in range of an Icon Bearer, and the only Icon Bearer is the Obelisk Bearer, you essentially heal for half. But if you're also in range of a Priest, so the Nephrite Priestess itself, you're going to be healing for full. And that doesn't mean you have to be in range of both of them to get the full bonus from Stone Warp. But what we're going to see is that the Warband overall is actually pretty double intensive, and your damaging pieces are actually quite slow. This is something that we're going to see as a theme in general in the Warband. So having to keep everything in range of your very specific rune marks, so the Icon Bearer and the Priest in this case, might actually be more difficult than the value of the ability might actually be. So overall, I think that the ability itself is quite low impact. Uh, generally, you're going to be saving your doubles for other more impactful abilities. But that being said, because you do have generally very few wounds and you do have a reaction that reduces the amount of wounds that you take maybe you'll get like a clutch stone warp off heal up a bunch of wounds not die from an attack and be able to swing back for pretty huge damage she also has access to the bloody tribute triple and this reads a fighter can only use this ability if an enemy fighter has been taken down by them this activation you pick a friendly fighter within nine inches of a visible friendly fighter with the jade obelisk and icon bearer rune marks so again this is going to be your obelisk bearer and that fighter makes a bonus move action with her sacrificial dagger she's going to be doing a weighted damage of 3.92 
on average, and with a double, so we're talking about Onslaught here, she's going to be doing on average 4.9 damage with her attacks. Now, I think that overall, the highlight of the Nephrite Priestess is actually that 20 wounds that she's bringing to the table for her 105 points. She's also your only hero option, so she's effectively mandatory if you want to take Jade Obelisk as your main faction. Her Damage, as we've seen, is fairly average, and her Bloody Tribute Triple, which allows the extra move on fighters, it, it kind of requires her to take down someone first. So considering that she doesn't have amazing damage to begin with, I think it's actually unnecessarily restrictive in order to actually get all that much use out of it. In addition, it's not like she is the focus for the Bloody Tribute. The fighter that you're going to be using it on has to be in range of one of your Icon Bearers. So so it, it kind of just adds more to the amount of bookkeeping that you're going to have to do during your game for really not all that much of a bonus. Not when you can just use a double four plus on movement on whichever fighter that you wanted to move anyway. But moving on from there, we have the Idol Arc. The Idol Arc, it has three attacks, it's strength three with one three damage. It's a very average for a chaff style fighter. It is fairly expensive at 105 points. It is the fastest fighter in your warband at movement eight. It's got toughness three and it's got eight wounds. It also has the beast rune mark, but otherwise it's got unimpressive stats for the 105 points that you are investing. It does have an ability of its own, the triple gaze of the idol arc. And that reads, you pick an invisible enemy fighter within 9 inches of this fighter, you subtract half the value of this ability rounding up from either the move characteristic or the toughness characteristic of that fighter to a minimum of 1 until the end of the battle round. So... Now, the Warband itself, I may have mentioned already, isn't actually very triple hungry. So most of the abilities you'll be looking to use are the doubles, which is one of the advantages of the Warband as a whole. The Warband itself, however, already has pretty high strength. So the toughness reduction on the Gates of the Eidolog isn't all that useful. But depending on the fighter that you're using it on, minus one to three move could actually be impactful. Now, I guess this is there to slow down fast uh, key enemy fighters so that they don't close the distance on your slower fighters and then be able to hit you first, effectively allowing more time for your guys to get into position and hit them back. But I think overall at the 105 points that you're going to be spending, you could effectively buy any other fighter in the warband, and I think they would be just as effective as the Idol Arc, simply because they have damage. Overall, I... I would not personally take the Idol Arc if you had the, the choice to. Again, the Beast Rune Mark is very much a hindrance in this case because your Idol Arc, despite having movement 8, won't be able to pick up treasure and it will just have a very hard time really doing anything impactful during your games. Moving on, we have your Obelisk Bearer. Obelisk Bearer is 110 points. It has four attacks at strength 424, which is very good. It's, it's a very solid damage profile. It has the Icon Bearer rune mark. It's got movement three. It has toughness four, and it's got 20 wounds. It has its own ability, Might of the Speaker, which reads, pick a visible friendly fighter within a number of inches of this ability equal to the value of the ability and you add three to the value of the ability of a friendly fighter with a jade obelisk and priest rune marks so we're talking about the nephrite priestess in this case is on the battlefield that fighter can make up to two bonus move actions bonus attack actions or bonus disengage actions in any combination it does on average six damage per hit which is very good and it will do on a double so using onslaught 7.5 damage so it's it's a very all-round solid fighter. You can see that it's efficient, 18.3 points per wound, and 20 wounds is still a very respectable amount of wounds with that damage profile, only for 110 points. We're going to see that it's not as efficient as Desecrators or Defacers that are coming up, but it's still extremely efficient in terms of the wider pool of fighters in the game. And the Stone Warp ability does require you to have an Icon Bearer on the field to use, so you're generally going to be taking an obelisk bearer anyway but as we've seen before with the stone warp ability it's give or take if you want to take an obelisk bearer or not i would take them i would take at least one i think during your during your warband creation now we're going to go into a couple of scenarios here so we've got might of the speaker versus rampage potentially might of the speaker is stronger than rampage as you can use it on other visible fighters to act out of turn and as a normal fighter the obelisk bearer has access to rampage if he needs to do things himself as might of the speaker requires the target to be visible and as we know fighters in warcry are not visible to themselves so he can't use might of the speaker on himself the range of the ability will mean that you'll essentially have to babysit him with another one 
one of your fighters in order to get use of that double bonus attack move or disengage action. But I don't see this as being far too much of an issue given how efficient your other fighters are and how much damage they can put out. If I had to make an educated guess, I would say that this is in there so that your Desecrators, which we're going to see, can use their reaction to reduce the damage when they get hit and then survive, still have Might of the Speaker to fight at full strength, and then swing again when their time comes to activate. If you do have the quad and the option to use either Might of the Speaker or Rampage, Might of the Speaker is almost always better, as in all likelihood you'll be using it on your Desecrators to get extra actions, and both flavors do more damage than the Obelix Bearer in combat. Now, moving on to Desecrators, there are two flavors. They are both 100 points. You have the Desecrator with Statue Smasher Hammer, it has three attacks of strength five with three five damage, movement three, toughness four, and twelve wounds. Or you have the desecrate with iconoclast warpick with four attacks at strength five, two five damage profile, toughness four, and again twelve wounds. They both have access to the rock shattering blow ability. So this adds one to the strength characteristic of the next melee action made by this fighter, this activation, and you add one to the damage points allocated by each hit and critical hit from that attack action. You can see how much damage they're doing. It's, it's quite high. Their weighted average damage, because they are at strength five, we're sitting at 7.19 for the Statue Smasher Hammer and 7.5 for the Iconoclast Warpick. They are both very efficient at 13.3 and 13.9 points per wound. Now this actually puts them at the second and third most points efficient units in the game in relation to their damage versus how many points you pay, which generally it's, it's very good. You can see that they have a very high damage output, able to one-shot most chaff fighters with a double, doing around about 10 wounds. Now, your Desecrators, they're your main damage dealers of the Warband, but because they only have 12 wounds, they're very much glass hammers. And if we compare them, for example, with Bloated Ones from Rockmire Creed, or even the Obelisk Bearer in Faction, you'll see that they trade those extra wounds for a lot of bonus damage. So that's really what you're bringing them for. Um, because they're relatively cheap at 100 points, there is the opportunity to spam them in your lists. So you can bring five to six of them and they will really be able to pull their weight and it gives a fairly numerous core actually for the rest of your warband to be built around. Now we're going to go into a couple of scenarios. Um, first up it's do you take picks or do you take hammers? The numbers seem to indicate that picks are better than hammers in all damage situations with the extra point of damage you get from the hammer not beating out the extra attack from the picks. So either is a good pick for your warband. Moving on to your doubles, are we going to use Rock Shattering Blow or Onslaught? We're going to go through both picks and hammers in this case. One attack using Onslaught with your pick is going to do 9.38 damage. One attack with Rock Shattering Blow on a pick, however, is going to do 10.25 damage. So if we had two attacks, using Onslaught with your picks, we're going to do a total of almost 19 damage, which is enough to almost kill most foot fighters in the game versus one attack with rock shattering blow and one attack with a normal damage profile because remember rock shattering blow can only be used on your next attack you're looking at 17.75 damage so in effect with your picks if you get to attack twice always use onslaught if you get to attack once always use your rock shattering blow now if you're using hammers one attack with your hammer is going to do 9.58 damage with Onslaught. One attack with Rock Shattering Blow and your hammer is going to do 9.25 damage. So actually less damage than your Onslaught. So this means that two attacks using Onslaught and a hammer is going to do 19.16 damage versus one Rock Shattering Blow and one normal attack with your hammer is going to do 16.4 damage. So with the hammer, you always want the Onslaught is it yields better damage numbers than Rock Shattering Blow. This is basically due to the already high base damage of the hammer is doing 3.5. So boosting that to 4.6 isn't as good as just getting more attacks. Moving on, we have Defacers. Now there are two flavors of Defacer. They are both 95 points. Defacers with Stone Cutter Tools and Antithate Bows. The Stone Cutter Tool Defacers, they have four attacks at strength four with a two, three damage profile, which I actually quite like. I think it's, it's fairly consistent. They have movement four, they have toughness four and 10 wounds versus the Bows, which have a range of three to 15. Two attacks at strength three with one three damage. And in combat, they're going to be hitting with three attacks at strength three with one three damage. 
They all have movement 4, they all have toughness 4, and they all have 10 wounds, again, at 95 points. The faces with stonecutter tools have access to hammering strikes. So, that reads, a fighter can only use his ability if an enemy fighter has been allocated damage points by an attack action made by them this activation. You add half of the value of this ability, rounding up the damage points allocated by each hit and critical hit for your next melee attack action. This activation that targets the enemy fighter. So if you've attacked once already, you get to add a whole bunch of extra damage if you're going to attack again. You can see here on your single damage profiles, your stone cutter tools are going to be doing 5.33 damage. Your bow is only going to be doing 1.63. Your tools are very efficient at 17.8 points per wound versus your bows, which are sitting at 58.5. Now, due to their high attacks and good strength, and surprisingly, Consistent damage profile at 2-3. The faces are very efficient for their points in terms of their damage output. They are, however, quite expensive in terms of a chaff unit. You're looking at 95 points for the fighter regardless of the loadout you choose. But that being said, they are still very efficient compared to the majority of other fighters in the game. Just not necessarily all the other fighters within their faction. With 10 wounds and toughness 4 and damage boosting abilities, you pretty much always want to bring the faces with stonecutter tools in this case. The real decision here, however, is if you want to go defaces at 95 points or desecrators at 100. That extra 5 points effectively gets you an extra 2 wounds, but the damage is actually pretty close on the tools and the picks and hammers. So if you roll a high enough double, you'll find that defaces actually outclass your desecrators, but the desecrators with the picks and hammers don't have to depend on a specific value on their dice. I think that overall you probably want to go with Desecrators as your main damage dealers, unless you really need that extra 5 points elsewhere, but ultimately both Defacers and Desecrators are very good picks for your Warband, regardless of what you choose. Now, let's look at some scenarios here. First up, we've got Stonecutter Tools versus Bows. Despite the extra range, I do think the Stonecutter Tools outclass them in all respects. If you want some range threat in your Warband, you can always ally something in, and it will generally do far better than your basic Defacers with Bows. Now, looking at hammering strikes, we're talking about hammering strikes versus onslaught here if you have doubles. One attack with onslaught is going to be doing 6.67 damage because the face is going to be putting out five attacks at strength four at two, three. One attack with hammering strikes, it really depends on what double you roll. So if you roll a double one or two, we're looking at 7.67 damage. If you roll a double three or four, you're looking at 10 damage. And if you roll a double five or six, you're looking at 12.33 damage for that attack. So two attacks with the onslaught, you're looking at 13.34 damage. And one attack normal, plus one attack with the hammering strikes, because remember, you have to hit first, and then do your hammering strikes, yields 13 damage if you roll a double one or two, 15 damage if you roll a double three or four, or 17, almost 18 damage if you roll a double five or six. So the takeaway from this is that if you get to attack twice, always use hammering strikes on the second attack as opposed to onslaught, as it always does more, unless you're rolling a double one or two, in which case onslaught puts out marginally more damage. If you get to attack once, obviously you're going to be using onslaught because hammering strikes requires you to do damage first and then attack with the double. So moving forward into allies, I really do think that the allies list for the Jade Obelisk are the usual suspects. So we're talking about a Varangard, maybe a Mind Stealer. Really, it's fast stuff that can counter the slowness of the Warband. Warband itself is in the interesting spot that they don't actually need any more damage off of their basic guys. So you would look for something to reach out and grab objectives, maybe provide disruption and deal with opposing chaff units. So I actually think that this case may be where the Blitzbringer would come in handy. It can can get more attacks through its own abilities, it can boost the damage of its attacks, it's got a pretty reliable net on a double, and it's got respectable 8-inch move for really not a lot of points, it's only 205, so it's definitely somewhere that I might be thinking about looking for a start. The Warband itself is also not very triple hungry, so you might also want to look at fighters with decent triples that they might be able to leverage off of. And for this, I'm specifically thinking about the Mind Stealer Spheranx. Now, it's good for a couple of reasons. It's got generally good stats. It's got good toughness, good wounds, good move. Um, it's got a net through telepathic threatening, and it's got its clutch quad, which may be able to turn off a fighter for you. I do think that it's a fighter that will be able to survive the battle, and it would generally be a pretty good distraction from your otherwise more fragile fighters. Now, some other options that you might be thinking about might be the AV Archon Disc 
for more, even more fast damage. The Pyrocaster out of Zinch Demons is also a very good option just to reach out and touch key fighters at range from turn one. Or maybe a great Bray Shaman to add some cheap uh, enemy movement shenanigans to your list. As a reminder, the Great Brace Shaman has a pull ability, so it can pick an enemy fighter and it can effectively pull it towards itself, which is almost the same as free movement for things like your Desecrators and your Defacers that might otherwise have a hard time getting across the battlefield and uh, really reaching out with all that damage that they have in combat. If we're talking about monsters, I feel like you could potentially bring a monster, maybe something like a Chimera, because it's fast, it can reach out, it can go and grab things, but I do want to to remind your guys you don't have any really cheap chaff units in the warband so if you do bring a chimera you would really have to be making sacrifices elsewhere it's not like the rest of your characters are particularly tanky they don't have a lot of damage soaked to them so you would really be making sacrifices in order to bring that now i've got a couple of lists here i think overall the jade obelisk they are very much a glass cannon style warband your fighters are going to be hitting really hard but they only have 12 wounds on your desecrators so they'll die really quickly if they get attacked. So you effectively have two options here in order to shore up this issue. You either put more fighters on the battlefield, so your opponent can't physically kill all of them before you do your damage, or you can include allies that can reach out and deal with those fighters before they actually hit your warband. I do think that building them slightly more swarmy could be a good way to go. It's been shown that movement three effectively isn't all that much of a hindrance this edition, so I think that mass desecrators could actually be a decent idea. I think you can get away with essentially running only one priestess, and Might of the Speaker on the Obelisk Bearer, whilst it's very good, I don't think it's worth building an entire warband around. So you can pretty much get away with running only one or two of the Obelisk Bearers. But then again, they are very cheap. They also have 20 wounds, so it might be something that you might want to look at. My first list that you can see here, it's effectively designed around two deployments of Obelisk Bearer and Double Desecrator, and a third of Priestess and Mind Stealer for added utility and maneuverability. Normally, I'd be looking for a fast, hard-hitting damage dealer ally for my warbands, but as we've seen, Desecrators just put out so much damage by themselves that it's not even necessary. So I feel like a Mind Stealer kind of, it falls in this happy medium between something like a Varangard and something a bit more squishy like a Blissbringer. The two deployments with the Bearer and the Desecrators, they both hit very hard and the Priestess Spheranx deployment is mainly there for the Mind Stealer to do its job, disrupting key opposing fighters and generally being a nuisance with its Toughness 5 whilst the rest of the Warbands takes time to get there. Now, my second list, while it's very similar to the first, can be built out of one box with an ally. So if you just picked up Sundered Fate, you'll have just the Warband itself. But if you wanted to expand that, this is kind of the direction that I would go into. Most of the fighters in the Warband are all around the same price. So here we've replaced Desecrators with Defaces and the Mind Stealer in my first Warband with a Varangard because, again, it hits fast, it's hard, and provides a very big distraction while your slower foot troops get essentially to where they need to be. An alternative, if you wanted to take a kind of less conventional Swarm Warband, might be to go eight Desecrators, a Defacer, and a Priestess for 10-man, where effectively every fighter, apart from the Priestess itself, hits like a truck. You can run your Desecrators in pairs, the opponent really has to be sure about what they're charging for fear of being killed. If you run your two Desecrators in base contact with each other, your opponent charges in, even if they kill one of them, the second Desecrator is going to hit back twice, putting all of that force to bear, doing those 20 wounds, and really knocking out whatever it is that runs into you. Now, I think overall, the Jade Obelisks do have what it takes to make for a very strong warband contender in terms of competitive standings. Whilst they may not have cheap chaff fighters, they do have some of the hardest hitting medium fighters in the game. So they're kind of in a unique position where if you're across the board from them, they don't really have any bad fighters, so things that you can pick on in terms of damage. So you have to be very sure that you're going to be able to kill them in that charge, in that one attack. Otherwise, your fighters are essentially just going to fall over in the return damage. But anyway, that's it from me for today. If you want more Warcry Warband breakdowns, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And let me know, let me know what you think about the Jade Obelisk, how you would build them, what kind of allies you might take if you've had any success with them recently. Please let me know down in the comment section below, and I will see you next time.